Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. This is week number two in the coronavirus crisis. At the beginning of this week, five states issued shutdown orders. But now by Thursday, we're up to 21 states. California, Connecticut, New Jersey, Illinois, Delaware, Hawaii, Indiana, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Mexico, Ohio, Oregon, Washington, West Virginia, Virginia, Wisconsin, Maryland, Nevada, Kentucky. All non-essential gatherings are prohibited. Almost every business is closed and the churches are not allowed to meet. These governors have essentially put the population out of work and millions of people are applying for unemployment. Unemployment claims this week were 3.4 million and that's just the start because at least 40 million people are now out of work. So we had a health crisis but now we have a man-made financial crisis. And that's a point we need to consider. Are these politicians doing the right thing in, in mandating the closing of all businesses? We certainly are called to obey the powers that be, Romans chapter 13. But let's not assume that these governors are all acting in wisdom. Rulers can be called of God to actually further punish people with bad policy. Remember uh, 1 Samuel 14, when Israel was battling the Philistines, King Saul made a foolish policy that none of his men were allowed to eat until Saul avenged himself from his enemies. So the Israeli troops had to battle in hunger. Israel had one crisis, a battle with the Philistines, and Saul created another unnecessary crisis, hunger. Saul's son Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. Or 2 Samuel 17, when Absalom took the bad counsel of Hushai, rather than listening to Ahithophel, 2 Samuel 17, 14, then Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the counsel of Hushai is better than the counsel of Ahithophel, for the Lord had ordained to thwart the good counsel of Ahithophel, so that the Lord might bring calamity upon Absalom. So there are many situations in the Bible where social leaders have made the situation worse by their foolish policy. Zechariah chapter 1 verse 15, but I, God, I'm very angry with the nations who are at ease, for while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. So let's not assume that all of the measures taken against this coronavirus are the best course of actions. Yes, they may be well-meaning, uh, they may be cautious, but they can also be very foolish reactions. Almost everyone is being put out of work, and how long can that last? You know, think about this. The, the governor of New Jersey closed down every business in the state as if the coronavirus problem was the same in Essex County as it is in far south Cape May County. It's as if everyone needs to be shut down if someone is made to shut down. And do these politicians really believe that the government can shut down all businesses and take care of everyone with a government check? This mindset is coming from the leftist socialist ideology that the government needs to give everyone a basic income check every month. Remember the Democratic primaries where Andrew Yang proposed to give everyone a basic income check of $1,000. And he was serious. $1,000 every month for life. These people really don't understand how business and the economy works. Maybe because having government jobs, uh, they live in their ivory towers, and they think money grows on trees, or, or rather, it can just be printed on printing presses. So from an economic point of view, this is going to be a disaster. Politicians can't wave a wand and tell people uh, not to go to work without there being a, a, a major economic crisis. Or even a major rebellion on the part of the citizenship. Walter Russell Mead in the Wall Street Journal wrote the following on the opinion page, quote, in a system where the party's wisdom 
and omnicompetence must always be acknowledged. A culture of sterility and conformism inevitably degrades decision making. It leads to grave errors. Who is me talking about? The Chinese Communist Party. But if you didn't read the headline, you would think he's talking about leftist politicians in the United States. And that's the point I made last week. As a society becomes more ungodly, it will operate less on sound principle and more on fantasy and irrational fear. As Walter Russell Mead explained, bad values degrade a people's decision-making ability. Well said. So I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but this overreach by government and the problems it's creating is going to be the major news story over the next few weeks. The government response is going to be more of the story than the virus itself. You know, these politicians, Governor Cuomo and, and Mayor de Blasio and, and Governor Murphy and Newsom and Pritzker and Lamont are right now basking in the sunlight of being heroes. And the media is cheering them on. But in a very short time, don't be surprised if they're vilified. The public turns against them. And this is Isaiah chapter 8. When people are hard-pressed and famished, it will turn out that when they're hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they look upward. And this actually happened in 1918 in the Spanish flu pandemic. The U.S. citizenship soon lost faith in and turned against the politicians. This week I was doing a little research into this. And here's a quote from a piece entitled Civil Liberties in the Time of the Influenza. Uh, quote, the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918-1919 triggered a repression of civil liberties within the United States due to measures crafted by medical experts which were intended to halt the spread of the disease. The flu caused municipal governments to take restrictive measures demonstrating that progressive error encroachment on civil liberties were not a uniquely federal phenomenon. Furthermore, Influenza led to public disillusionment with scientific public policy and raised questions regarding the efficacy of laws requiring the sacrifices of civil liberty. So, just don't expect in the end of all this that the people are going to be happy with the government's response. This might end up undermining the uh, leftist faith in a nanny state, which is probably a good thing. I recorded uh, my radio program version of this YouTube on Monday, three days ago. And in it, I made some of these negative comments regarding the economic shutdown. Then I started to second guess myself. I mean, there's nothing worse than complainers and, and naysayers coming out of the woodwork when people are in a crisis. You know, I don't want to give any credence to these, these nutty people who are all over the internet saying that this virus is a hoax, that it's made up by a bunch of communists to take over the government. But at the same time, I really do want to be honest with my gut feelings and my intuition, because whenever I don't listen to that inner voice, I inevitably miss the boat. So I actually was about to take down the program and rewrite it, but after doing a couple more hours of, of research on the internet, I decided to stay with my original program and, and take the heat of being negative toward this economic shutdown. Because by Tuesday, articles were already coming out questioning and criticizing the shutdown, that this is a wrong approach to take. Even the national director of the um, Institute of Allergies and Infectious Disease said this way, quote, we must not impose overly drastic measures that will result in unintended consequences, including other health issues. If you knock down the economy completely and disrupt infrastructure, you may be causing health issues, unintended consequences for people who need to be able to get to places and can't. If you knock down everything, you're going to crash the entire society. And the Trump administration is beginning to question the shutdown everything approach. 
Headlines on Tuesday, Trump hints at possibly a less restrictive approach in coronavirus fight. And the president tweeted out this week, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem. Again, common sense tells us that the government can't tell everyone to stop working and send everyone a check in the mail to keep them going. A thousand dollar check will not suffice. The government cannot supply for everyone's needs. People have to work. And this lockdown cannot last for three months, like some of these governors are talking about. But, you know, for those with a previous statist mindset, they assume this is going to work because they already lean toward this communistic, socialistic model where the government can and should control every aspect of society. And that even all businesses should be state-owned and that everyone should be an employee of the state. Well, look at how well that's working in Venezuela. So this crisis is, is not making people. It's showing who people really are. The crisis only exposes people's core ideology. That leftist congresswoman in Minnesota, Ilhan Omar, called for the government to take over all private hospitals. Whether you favor liberty or a nanny state plays a major role in how you're going to address this crisis. How you approach any of life's problems are based upon your system of beliefs. And that's one of the reasons God sends a crisis in the first place. Well, here are some telltale articles that have been posted this week, kind of showing how the public is going to react over the next few weeks. Fox News. Trump calls for restarting the economy by Easter. We have to get back to work. President Trump said Tuesday during a Fox News virtual town hall that he wants the country's economy open by Easter amid questions over how long people should stay home and businesses should remain closed to slow the spread of the virus. Trump argued that he doesn't want to turn the country off and see a continued economic downfall from the pandemic. He also said he worries the U.S. will see suicide by thousands if coronavirus devastates the economy. We lose thousands and thousands of people a year to the flu. We don't turn the country off. Trump said during the interview, Trump added, we lose much more than that to automobile accidents. We don't call up the automobile companies and say, stop making cars. We get back to work. Taking questions before Trump, Vice President Mike Pence said, the administration is not considering a nationwide coronavirus lockdown like some states and cities have taken. Here's an article from PJ Media. Trump considers lifting social distancing restrictions to restart economy. As the president's economic advisors continue to paint a bleak picture of the future of the economy under quarantine, Donald Trump is beginning to weaken in his resolve to maintain the strict social distancing recommendations that have shuttered the nation. At an evening news briefing yesterday, Trump said our country wasn't built to be shut down. Uh, this is not a country that was built for this. Certainly this is going to be bad, Trump said. This writer goes on to state, if Trump thinks the economy will recover in time for the election, he's kidding himself. But he's right to weigh the health benefits of a shutdown against the economic disaster from a prolonged cessation of most business activity. Quite literally, millions of businesses and tens of millions of jobs are at risk of simply disappearing. It wouldn't be a recession or even a depression. It would be an economic collapse. So this pushback against the current reaction to the virus is, is evolving. Uh, the, the president and other voices are, are putting these health advocates on notice. Uh, people need to get back to work. We can't risk having the economy collapse. Matt Walsh writes in The Daily Wire, Media pushing a false choice. This is a good article, so bear with me as I read it. Uh, the debate over the coronavirus response seems to be centered around a false dilemma. We are told, mostly by the left-wing media personalities, that the choice is either to slow the spread of the virus or to not slow it, to take it seriously 
or to not take it seriously. According to this version, those advocating a protracted economic ruining nationwide shutdown are on the side of taking the disease seriously and slowing the spread. But those who feel apprehensive about intentionally plunging into another Great Depression are on the side of not taking the disease seriously and doing nothing whatsoever to slow its spread. The caricaturing of the let's not destroy the economy side gets even more absurd. Those of us on that end of the spectrum are accused of putting the economy over people. We are embracing mass death and consigning our grandmothers to the morgue. As one media guy put it to me, we have a hard on for mass murder. Of course, the whole notion that people and economy are two separate categories and that one must choose between preserving the former or the latter is ludicrous. The economy is people. When the economy crashes, people's lives crash. If the economy is in ruins, people's lives are in ruins. And so you see the conflicting values here between the medical community and people and their livelihood. Between let's just keep working and quarantine as best as possible and those who say let's shut everything down because it's too risky if anyone gets sick. Here's another interesting article. If it saves even one life, is it totally worth it? Question mark. Sarah Hoyt really sticks her neck out on the line in this article. As death from COVID-19 mount in the United States, the media keeps announcing them as if it's absolutely the end of the world. I have no idea what it'll be up to by the time this article goes up, but I guess it's probably around 500 or a little under. And sure, it's easy to get panicked by that. 500 people is a lot of dead people. If you tell people on social media that, yeah, it's a big number, but not as much, not by far as the number of annual flu deaths in the United States, you're going to be called a monster. Asked what if this person were your spouse, your mother or your child, and told that all these measures and destroying our economy are completely worth it if we save even one life. But the problem is you can't save that one life not forever. If we were an immortal species, which only dies under unusual circumstances, say when we drop from buildings or when we contract a flu that crosses the species barriers because someone in Wuhan, China needs some yummy bat soup, then the if it saves just one life part would be completely justified. As it is, though, we all die sooner or later. At most, death like taxes this year might be postponed. And given the average age of the people dying of this flu, the truth is that if they don't die of this, they will die of the next epidemic, cold or flu. So I reference these articles just to give that other perspective, just to keep us from going along with the mass hysteria, because maybe maybe when all is said and done, people are going to look back at this reaction in March of 2020 and see it as unnecessary and overblown. Like many bad flu seasons in the past, the flu just could not be stopped. It just had to run its course. And in the end, we may not forestall that much death by shutting down the economy. I don't know, we, but we just should be open to that perspective. And I say all this really as, as someone who is probably benefiting from this overreaction. I've had pneumonia twice. These viruses always go down into my lungs. And it seems like every other winter, I'm having to take antibiotics to deal with bronchitis. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if I get taken out by coronavirus. But rather than shutting everything down, I can quarantine myself. I can be careful. Everyone in the country doesn't have to stop working or traveling just because of me or people like me. Governor Cuomo said businesses will be forced to close. Families will face severe financial strain. But if all of these measures save just one life, they are worth it. And that mindset 
If it saves just one person's life, it's worth it. Historically, has been the justification for all sorts of bad policy. It was the propaganda to promote Obamacare. Now it's the propaganda to promote Medicare for All and the Green New Deal. But consider this. The CDC estimates that every year since 2010, the flu in the United States has resulted in 45 million illnesses, between 140,000 and 810,000 hospitalizations, and between 12,000 and 61,000 deaths per year. Now, those are broad numbers, but just consider last year, the 2018-2019 flu season. The CDC reports that 35.5 million people were sick with the flu last year. 16.5 16.5 million went to a healthcare provider for their illness. 500,000 people were hospitalized, and there were 34,200 deaths from the flu last year. So far in the United States, the coronavirus, there have been only 50,000 cases and 600 deaths. So you say, well, what about Italy? So far, 5,500 people have died from. COVID-19, but in the 2016-2017 flu season, 25,000 people in Italy died from the flu. Italy has this problem because it has one of the oldest populations in the world, and so older people die of the flu before old age gets them. Now, this is not to say we shouldn't take extra precautions with this virus. Uh, We should, but let's remember We live in a world filled with disease. We are always at risk. You can run and hide, but someday the Grim Reaper is going to knock at your door. I have to be careful in saying this, but it seems like with this extra virus, the public is waking up to something that happens every year, and that's death by disease. And so everyone's panicking. Did you know that every year there are about 40,000 new HIV AIDS cases in America? Why doesn't the media talk about this crisis? Well, because we've become accustomed to it. But there are 40,000 people more every year who have to live the rest of their lives on medications with all the side effects. And for the rest of their lives, they're going to be faced with their own vulnerability and mortality. Uh, People are afraid of COVID-19 as if this is the first time they're being introduced to their own mortality, but this is called death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, uh, the wages of sin is death. Genesis 3, from dust you were taken and to dust you shall return. Now, of course, we can understand the fear, but the solution is not to stock up on toilet paper or refuse to go out the door or insist that the government do something, the solution is really God. Specifically, the person and work of Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for our sins, giving us the promise of forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. Isaiah chapter 53. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. Eternal life eternal health. And that becomes a lot more meaningful when you're sick and dying, when you can't catch your breath and you're desperate for healing. There is a common medical insignia called the caduceus. It's two snakes around a pole with wings on top. You know, we see that on medical office buildings. We see it on badges. The World Health Organization has a flag with a serpent on a pole. Now, there's a lot of speculation concerning the source. You know, some see this as coming from Greek mythology, but it actually comes from the Bible. When Israel was living on the Sinai Peninsula under Moses, the people complained against God and there was an infestation of poisonous snakes. The people went to Moses to ask for help and and Moses told them to do a very strange thing. Numbers chapter 21, verse 8, Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, a pole, and it shall come about that 
everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. So why did God want healing to come through looking at a serpent on a pole? Well, 1,400 years later, Jesus, the Son of God, comes to earth. And he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. One must look to Jesus on the cross for healing, for salvation. But it was Jesus on the cross, not a serpent, a serpent being the symbol of sin and evil. But Jesus, in hanging on the cross, He took our sin and he became sin for us. He became that serpent hanging on the tree. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And back to the Isaiah 53 text, he poured out himself to death and he was numbered with the transgressors Yet he himself bore the sin of many, and he interceded for the transgressors. So of the many lessons that we can learn from this COVID-19 event, one lesson is the limitation of human government. That government cannot save you, even from this little virus. So, So think about this. What is the government actually doing for us at this time? Politicians are standing behind microphones and calling for action. Some want the military to show up and pass out food and build hospital beds in convention centers, even though there is no current need for those extra facilities. But honestly, the government is doing very little. The government cannot make toilet paper or cleaning products. The retailers and the manufacturers are the ones keeping the stores filled. There's no need to hoard or to ration these things. People who are doing this know very little about manufacturing and supply chains. And the government isn't even providing medical help. It's all being done by private doctors and nurses. The government doesn't make any of the medical masks. The government doesn't make any of the respirators. The government doesn't even make any of the test kits and vaccines. A private company called Cefed has come up with a new test for the coronavirus that gives the results in just a matter of hours, and that's coming to market. And a number of pharmaceutical companies have come up with vaccines that are now going into the trial period. And the government hasn't done any of this. Yet these politicians give the impression that they're pontificating is solving the crisis. The political left is actually angry with Trump because he's not implementing the Defense Production Act to force companies to make certain products. Because as Trump has responded to these critics, the private sector is ramping up on its own. They don't even need government force or interference. Now, of course, the government can use its God-given power of the sword to keep people from spreading the virus, but even that's not a major thing. People on their own will be more cautious. They will take extra measures to isolate themselves when there's a pandemic, even without the government saying anything. Remember, the federal government has this emergency alert system. Every once in a while, you hear it on the radio, you know, this is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. And then you hear the beeps. And then the announcer says, you know, if this was an actual emergency, you know, you do this or that. Well, a number of years ago, John Stossel did a report on this government program where millions of dollars are wasted keeping this program going so that the public knows when there is a national emergency. When the fact is that the private media, for free, on its own, would inform the public way more and way sooner than the federal government. For example, the media was covering 9-11 before the government even knew about it. And the president was watching the news channels to find out what was going on. 
So let's just remember that the government has very, very limited abilities. Yes, in wartime, government does play a more significant role, but not so much when it comes to pathogens and many other social problems. You know, the government is not going to solve your drug and alcohol problem. The government is not going to solve your marriage problems, your, your job problems, your child rearing problems. You have to do business with God yourself. And you have to change your own character and your own motivations because deliverance comes from the Lord. So don't be surprised if this whole event will be remembered by political historians and theorists as another example of government limitations, government ineptitude, government inability. And this whole event may just be another rebuke from God against many Americans who put their whole trust in government policy and wisdom. So in today's program, I haven't even gotten into discussion concerning the political partisanship in all this, uh, discussing the way this crisis is being used to push socialism. I haven't even had time to look at the prophetic aspect of, of this virus. So that's why this program on the virus crisis is going to be a series next week. Part three, the saga continues. But let me close with a point made in a Hollywood zombie movie. No, this isn't the Bible, but it's really amazing when we see a Hollywood movie actually pointing out a biblical godly truth. And the movie is Will Smith in I Am Legend back in 2007 at the beginning of this zombie apocalypse uh, genre. Mankind genetically engineers a virus to heal people of cancer. But the virus mutates and turns everyone into violent animals. Will Smith is a military doctor. He is hiding out in New York City. He's a lone survivor. Eventually, a young woman and her son join Will Smith at his hideout. And she asks him to come with her to a refuge colony in New England. Smith protests. He says, I'm not going to leave the city. I'm not going to let this happen. I can still fix this. Besides, how do you know there's a colony? And the young woman reluctantly says, God told me, and God has a plan. Smith says, God told you, the God, there is no God. She says, yes, God told me to turn on the radio and hear your broadcast and come to the South Street Seaport to meet you. And I arrived just in time to save your life. He must have sent me for a reason. The world is quieter now. We just have to listen. If we listen, we can hear God's voice. We can hear God's plan. Will Smith says, let me tell you about God's plan. There are 6 billion people on earth. When the infection hits, 90% were dead. That's 5.4 billion people dead. Then the rest became creatures who fed on everyone else. Every single person that you or I have ever known is dead. There is no God. Well, this woman still holds on to her faith, faith in the goodness of God and faith in the plan of God. And the providence of God continues in the movie where Will Smith identifies the cure and he realizes that this woman is one sent to carry uh, the cure to this particular colony. And at the end of the movie, the woman enters the colony and as the gates open, there's the panorama of a New England town. And in the forefront is a clapboard white New England church with a cross on the steeple. So amazingly, the underlying theme in this movie is that mankind in his hubris, in attempting to solve the world's problems, only causes more problems, causes more evil, and only God can fix the problem. And that theme happens to be the whole theme of the Bible. Romans chapter 5, verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And my prayer is that you would quiet your heart and mind, stop listening to the chaos of, of the world, and hear the voice of God. Because he's calling you to put your faith 
in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Thank you for making God and country a part of your discipleship in the Word. Stay strong in the Lord and may Jesus Christ reign.